السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اللہ مصلی وسلم مبارک اللہ سعیدنا و حبیبنا ابن عبد اللہ ولا علیہ و طیبین و طاہرین و صحابت ہی و منطب یوم بحسان علیہ یوم الدین اللہ معنی اعوذب کا ان عضل اضل او عضل اضل او عظلم او عظلم او اجہل او یجہل علیہ آئی سیک ریفیوج ان اللہ سبحان و تعالیٰ دیٹ آئی شوڈ گو اسٹری او بی لیڈ اسٹری دیٹ آئی ٹرپ او بی ٹرپڈ اور آئی او پریس او بی او پریسڈ اور آئی بی اگنورنٹ اور اگنورنس بی ڈن ٹو می اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شاہلی صدری و یسر علی عمری باخل العقدم من لسانی یفق و قولی او مائی رب اوپن مائی چیسٹ از مائی ٹاسک فار می اینڈ ریموو دا امپیڈمنٹس فرام مائی اسپیچ سو دیٹ یو می انڈرسٹینڈ واٹ آئی سے Uh, this evening is the 16th of Safar, 1437 years after Hijrat. Uh, yesterday we had completed up to ayat number uh, uh, 252. Uh, we completed the presentation on Bani Israel and tonight inshallah we are going to begin with ayat number 253. And this is the beginning of the third para. So if you look at the division of Quran and para, which are 30 paras, then we are now starting the third para. And in uh, hopefully inshallah in the next two Uh, lectures we'll complete the uh, surah al-baqarah and then we're going to start with the next uh, surah so let us just uh, start with this first ayah uh, which talks about the uh, different uh, messengers that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent uh, the different prophets so a'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim tilka ar-rusulu faddalna ba'duhum ala ba'd minhum man kallama allah wa rafa ba'duhum darajat و آتینا عیسب نہ مریم البینات و عیدنا بروح القدس ولاشا اللہ مقتل مقتط الزین ممباد ہم ممباد جات حم البینات ولا کنخ تلف و فمن ہم من آمن و من ہم من کفر ولاشا اللہ مقتط الو ولا کن اللہ یاف الو ما یورید سو ایز یو سی فرام دس آیت اٹس ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ڈفرینٹ میسنجرز بینگ سینڈ سو وی ہیو میڈ سم آف دوز میسنجر ایکسل ود انادر And among them are they to whom Allah spoke, and some of them he exalted in ranks, and we gave clear signs to Isa, son of Maryam, and strengthened him with Holy Spirit. And if Allah had so willed, those after them would not have fought one another. After clear signs had come to them, but they disputed with one another. So there were some who believed and some who disbelieved, and if Allah willed, they would not fight with one another, but Allah does what he wills. So this is the first ayat uh, that we will be uh, starting on with uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah and this ayat points to this useless uh, kind of a discussion that often we see people indulging in uh, to discuss which prophet has a higher status and which prophet has a lower status. Uh, the fact that the prophets have different status is there and I think this cannot be really disputed. Uh, in, um, in the, uh, there is a hadith of uh, our Prophet ﷺ which is what you call Isra the journey that he took for, from going from uh, the earth to the heavens and in the heavens he uh, went through different stages and he saw prophets in various heavens according to the rank that Allah had assigned to them but this prerogative of assigning ranks to the prophets uh, which our Prophet ﷺ witnessed also is the prerogative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not for for us to really to, to assign a position to a prophet or uh, clear, create a distinction between them uh, to excel one on, on the other. The background of this ayat is, was that, uh, uh, and this is a hadith uh, which is quoted from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, uh, that there was a dispute between a Muslim and a Jew in Medina, and that they, they, which led into an argument, and the argument was uh, whether Musa salam was of a higher position or whether Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, was of it a high position. The argument uh, led to uh, uh, a bit of an altercation in which the Muslim slapped the Jew and the Jew went and complained to our Prophet وسلم, and as a result the Prophet also uh, said that he, as, as, as Muslims uh, we really cannot uh, you know, create these divisions or, or, or differentiate between, the, between, the, between, between different messengers. So what really we are not allowed to do is to discriminate between the messengers. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, there are some, as we can see from this ayat, some of the messengers and prophets have been exalted. Uh, the reason why some are exalted, maybe this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying people, is, is trying us, uh, because uh, Muslims, we will see in one of the ayahs uh, coming towards the end of Surah Baqarah is where we need to honor all the prophets and we need to love all the prophets. I think that's part of our faith. And uh, uh, 
making this distinction sometimes can actually become a great fitna uh, because it shows that we are really not worshipping, uh, we are not really worshipping Allah and we are really not looking at the message that was delivered but we are actually going in after personality worship. When we go with personality worship that's the time we start to assign ranks and status to different people. So therefore there was, there's another hadith in which our Prophet ﷺ said, don't give me superiority even over Prophet Yunus ﷺ. So therefore as Muslims we need to be, we need to treat all the Prophets as messengers of Allah, as people who are far close to Allah than we are and as a result each one of them has an exalted position in, in our eyes. So therefore uh, giving fazila to someone uh, again is not at the cost of belittling, be, belittling uh, anybody else's prophet. I mean whether a prophet is dear to a Christian or to a Jew, he is still dear to a Muslim. Uh, this is not true for, the, for other people but uh, like a Jew would probably not honor Isa salam or not honor our Prophet salam. But the distinction of a Muslim is that he honors all the messengers that are there. Whether, he, whether that is Musa salam or whether that is uh, Isa salam or uh, Dawud salam or Suleiman salam. And this is very distinct when you look at Judaism because in Judaism they make a huge dis distinction. In fact, if you look at the books and you read uh, the Torah, you would find how, de how uh, Jews degrade some of their messengers. Uh, and, and particularly uh, Suleiman salam has a very, very uh, sort of, you know, the way he is mentioned within the Torah in some places a in a very degrading way. Uh, but that's, again, Muslims have to rise above that and really not indulge in, uh, in creating these distinctions. Because it's not really up to the slave to decide which of the messenger or which of the prophet is better. This is uh, Allah's uh, prerogative. Uh, like I said, the last ruku of Surah Baqarah is La, la Nufariqu Baina Ahdim Mir Rusuli. We do not make distinction between any messengers. And I think that is something that should be very clear to us uh, uh, over here. <coughs> Uh, also, let's just look at this ayat and it says that uh, uh, if and if Allah had built, those after them would not have fought one another. I think this is something that is uh, uh, also there that we need to uh, keep in mind that, uh, 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 you know, we cannot make any distinction between them. Some of the messengers have been extremely, uh, uh, you know, remembered by Allah in a very fond words and uh, there's no denying of the fact that uh, Ibrahim uh, he is remembered or, or Allah has actually called him Khalilullah and, you know that is the that is that the kind of distinction that's been given to him uh, Isa alayhi salam is, is called the Ruhullah that's again a distinction Musa alayhi salam is called uh, Kalamullah because Allah spoke to him and our Prophet sallallahu is called Habibullah which means that he is he is uh, the beloved of, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, these are the credentials that, uh, uh, that prophets have. They are, they are all ambassadors of Allah. And this, uh, these attributes or names that have been given to them are names that are given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to reject them. If a Muslim is to, re to, to reject even a single, uh, even a, a, a Muslim needs to really respect them all. If a Muslim was to reject even a single of the prophet, even a single of the messenger, uh, then he is no longer considered to be a Muslim. For, uh, to be a Muslim, we need to be uh, even-handed and accept all the messengers. And I think that is something that we have to uh, accept that. As a follower of Allah, we cannot uh, reject them. Now, also this ayat says that if Allah had willed, had so willed, those after them would not have fought one another. Uh, Allah will not force people. I think this is something that we need to understand. Allah has provided the path of guidance and the path of misguidance to all of us and given us the ability to think through. Uh, we have a, and that's the reason why we will be punished or we will be uh, uh, rewarded because this will has been given to people in order to choose which path they want to take. So this is not the will of, if Allah had will, you know, people would have always followed a single path. But the freedom of choice that, that has been given to people is that Allah will not force people to follow a particular way. He will not force people to adopt a sharia or adopt a path. He has given them the ability to make this distinction. And this is the reason why this earthly life for us is a great trial. It is, uh, and it is, this is the reason why Allah has sent so many messengers to guide us. So that we use these ability, we use the message, we use the guidance that comes in, in from the messengers as well as from the various books that are there. And so therefore we can use the limited freedom that we have in order to make our own choice. And that is the reason why 
human beings are higher even than the angels because angels cannot actually do anything wrong. They're programmed, they will always do what is right. But human beings have this ability that they can choose between right and wrong and it is this choice that is actually resulting in their punishment or in their, uh, in their reward. Now in the next ayat, uh, after looking at this, uh, which is ayat number 254, we're going to be going back to the ahkam of uh, spending and uh, you know, spending in the way of Allah is repeatedly stressed in Quran and uh, this is uh, uh, really an ayat to prepare Muslims to spend uh, their wealth uh, uh, from what Allah has given because after this, when we finish this ahkam on spending and the real uh, stress on spending, we are going to be looking at the ahkam relating to riba, which is completely opposite to spending. Riba means that you know you want to collect more and more and you want to get more and more profit out of that, which is, an, which is completely an opposite to spending in the way of Allah. So this is uh, the next ayat is preparing Muslims to spend their wealth. Uh, so, the, so this is where the emphasis is. Let's look at, and uh, the spending is really a, a, a practical demonstration of whether we have the right aqidah on Allah or not. It's very easy for us to say that there is one God. It's very easy for us to recite the kalma. But the practical demonstration of tawheed, the practical demonstration of tawheed is that whether we are willing to spend what is dear to us, what Allah has given us in the way of Allah. Who do we consider the owner of the wealth that we have today? Are we the owner or the owner of this is Allah? Now if the owner of this we believe that is Allah, then we will abide by the commandments of Allah and spend out of what Allah has given to us. So the practical demonstration of Tawheed, which is the practical demonstration that we believe in single, uh, single uh, Allah, is to, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to comply by the ayahs that are going to be revealed. So let's look at ayat number 254. Ya amanu min qabli an yatiya la bayun fihi wala khulatun wala shafa'a while kafirun ahmu zalimun, O you who believe, spend out of what we have provided for you before the day comes when there will be no bargaining, nor friendship, nor intercession, and the unbelievers are the unjust, which means that those people who do not spend, who do not spend for, uh, you know, for the betterment of mankind of, on, on other people, uh, Quran says, and the unbelievers are the unjust. I think this is a very strong, we are going to talk about this a uh, little later on. Uh, Clearly over here, this is a belief of Allah in words and in deeds. Belief of Allah in words is reciting the, uh, reciting the kalma, that's in words. But in deeds it is to spend in the way of Allah. This is the most important part, the, 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 uh, you know, this deed of spending in the way of Allah is a practical demonstration of our belief that we believe in one God. We believe in that there is a creator who is above, the, above us. So accepting Allah as our owner. Because Allah is asking us to give a small portion of what He has given to us. Clearly a very large portion we still keep to ourselves. If you look at zakat, it's just two and a half percent. We still keep the 97 and a half percent with us. So Allah says in zakat, just give two and a half percent of the wealth that you have. And this giving two and a half percent of our wealth is a demonstration that we believe in Allah. And if we do not give zakat out of the, out of the wealth that we have, this shows that actually we have no belief in Allah. We have no belief in Allah. I mean, Allah could have said that I have given you these, uh, all the wealth, you spend 97.5 percent and keep two and a half percent. He could have done that also. He is the owner of all the wealth that we have. And we would still have had to abide. But because Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, He is merciful as a result and He knows that how deeply uh, the love of wealth is entrenched in our hearts. Therefore, He said only spend two and a half percent of the wealth every year, once in a year, give zakat out of that. And when we do that, we are actually uh, you know, demonstrating that we have a true belief in Allah. We are accepting that Allah is the, is an, uh, is the owner of this wealth and that he's asking a small portion of that wealth to be given to poor people and we are actually abiding by his commandment. Uh, you know, these, uh, when we talk of going from here to paradise, uh, honestly, this is, uh, it's easier to say that and pray that we should uh, go into paradise, but clearly par to go into paradise and to have a, have a, a palace over there, uh, this is an expensive proposition. It's a very expensive proposition because things in paradise are not as cheap as 
we think that they are there in this world. I mean, it's like a fifth, you know, a thousand yard plot in Mia Valley and a thousand yard plot in defense. The price is completely different. So therefore, we need to have enough earnings when we reach paradise that we, are, we have the ability to be able to buy buy a palace over there. When we spend in the way of Allah over here, we are really converting the wealth that we have in this world and sending it to the next world and actually making, uh, making our palace over there. Now, if you're not sending, if you're not spending, it's like you're working in Jeddah and you're keeping all your wealth over there and one day, you, are, you know, you are told, now this is your duhul, uh, you go out of this country and you keep everything over here and you can take nothing and you arrive over here at the airport completely, uh, you know, uh, penniless and uh, uh, destitute with nothing over here. So you'll, you'll end up over here, you've worked and earned a lot, uh, or, or, you know, over there, but you've sent nothing over here. You understand nothing and as a result when you arrive and exactly that's not what we want to do when we reach into paradise. When we reach into paradise, really we want to make sure that we have, we have enough wealth stored in over there so that our palace is ready and we have all the good things over there and this can only happen if we earn Neki. Every time we earned a good deed, this becomes a currency for the hereafter. Every time we spend in this world, uh, it will, you know, it will, and when we spend in this world, it will benefit people. When we spend for the sake of Allah in this world, it will benefit people and it will also help us benefit in the hereafter. Now, if our belief in the hereafter is weak, and this is a test, honestly, if our belief in the hereafter is weak, people will be really reluctant to spend on, in the way of Allah. This actually is a very good indicator to show how much belief we have in the hereafter. If we are not spending, if, we, if our heart gets constrained when a poor person asks us, when a poor servant asks us for money and we are unable to spend on them, the reason for that is that we don't believe that this is going to be given to us in the hereafter. If you have a firm belief, you would think this to be a great opportunity that has come your way. Like a poor relative comes to you and says, look, I'm in a deep trouble, I need some money, I need some help, and you say, sorry, you know, I don't have anything to give. I gave you money last month also, didn't I give you money last month? Now, this means that uh, opportunity came to us for investment, and we have let that opportunity go away. So please spend freely in Allah's way. Uh, like I said, this is not an easy thing because, uh, because of the fact that uh, the, the love of wealth is, is dear to us. And uh, I think we need to think about this kind of a weakness that is there in people. Why do people uh, feel complacent about the hereafter? We all, all of us believe that we, in the hereafter, we are going to get paradise. We are complacent of the fact, just because of the fact that we are Muslim. And as a result, we don't have that kind of an urgency, although we are getting old. I mean, I've seen people who are 80, 85 years old, and they are worried about, about uh, you know, investing, which will give them a return in 20 years after that. And I, you know, somebody came and asked me, he said that, you know, and he's well in his mid-70s or maybe close to 80s in Yas. He says, I want to buy, a, you know, three plots uh, in this uh, defense city. And I said, defense city, why are you investing over there? This will take another, you know, 15, 20 years for it to mature. But his, he's not thinking that this may be the last few years of his life. He's thinking 20 years ahead that this will be multiplied. It will become, you know, an investment of, uh, you know, 50 lakhs will become, you know, five crores. But, but who, how can you really take that kind of a view? You are, we are so advanced. In, but this is how shaitan actually does he, that sense of urgency to spend on poor people and convert our currency or the worldly wealth into, into <coughs> neki is not there. We have this attitude of just sitting back and, and, and really having a sit back, sitting back attitude. Anyway, uh, the other point that is made over here is that one of the things that also makes us complacent is the fact that there will be some kind of intercession on the Day of Judgment. So, Quran makes it clear that, O oh, you who believe, spend out of what we have provided for you before the day comes when there is no bargaining, nor friendship, nor intercession. Uh, Quran is very clear and the unbelievers are the unjust. So, Quran repeatedly actually negates this concept of intercession. That just because your father or your mother were very, uh, uh, you know, were very pious, uh, Alhamdulillah for them, Alhamdulillah for them, but they cannot intercede on your behalf. If, if, our, if, if our parents were, uh, for, were, were, were really naked uh, and we are not, then it's our problem, it's our funeral. Honestly, they cannot do, they cannot intercede on, on our behalf because the reason for this is intercession is there when people do not have full knowledge. 
where people do not have full knowledge. So if I, if, if, uh, if I have a boss and I go to him and I say, look, I know this person, he's really good, we need to employ him, I think he's, but if I, my boss knows everything about him, why, why does he need to take my opinion about it? And Allah is all knowledgeable. Allah is all knowledge. He has, he even knows the intentions that are there, even the smallest intention of why my eyes uh, move in one direction or the other direction. He knows that. He knows the intent. So therefore, there is no reason for, for, for him to ask for intercession or for any intercession to be useful because the knowledge of Allah is, is perfect. He knows. <clears throat> In fact, there's a very uh, interesting ayah which, uh, which is well ahead, Surah Munafiqun. But I really like to actually narrate this ayah because it's very much related to uh, this ayah. This ayah actually talks about a person who dies. It talks about a person who has just died and there he is in front of Allah and he says, Oh Allah, just send me back, just send me back for one day and I will be the most pious person most pious person, you know, the, 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 this is what he's really saying. So let's look at this ayat from Surah Munafiqun. It's a, it's a very uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting ayat, uh, ayat number uh, 10 and 11. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَاتِيَا أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْلَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيفَ صَدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّوَالِهِينَ so here is a person who has died and now his hisab is being taken and, and said, spend out of what we have given you before your death comes. So Allah is telling us, we are still lucky that we are alive. We are still lucky. This is a great blessing that we are alive. So Allah says, and spend out of what we have given you before death comes to you so that he should say, my Rabb, would you grant me a brief respite? Just give me one little respite so that I should, uh, should, that, should that, so that I should give sadqa and be the righteous, be among the righteous. So here's a rich man who left everything behind and now uh, he's asking, just give me a little respite so that I can become, I can do sadqa and I can be the righteous. And the response that Allah gives to him is, nafsan idha ja ajaloha, wallahu khabirun bima But Allah, Allah does not give respite when the appointed time comes and Allah is aware of what you do. So the day, you know, our breath stops, the, the day our heartbeat stops, our qiyamat has taken place. That's our qiyamat. That's our day of judgment. That's it. For us, it's game, set, match. We are history. And after that, no matter, and it's no point, there's no point. You pass to a graveyard, there's no point being the richest man in the graveyard. It makes no difference whether you are the poorest person in the graveyard or you are the richest person in the graveyard. What matters is what nakis have you done before you went to your grave. Because once you are in your grave, it's over. The game is over. And I think we should consider these moments to be extremely blessed moments while we are still alive. Really, we must consider this to be a great blessing that we are still alive and we must use this time and we must use our wealth for the betterment of people. We must not miss a single opportunity. I tell my children, I tell my children whenever they go to a mosque, even if you don't have anything, just give one rupee, one dollar, one cent, whatever is there in your pocket, put as a sadqa because make these small investments. Sometimes we think, oh, unless I become a millionaire, when I become a millionaire, I'm going to make a mosque. Well, you may not have become a millionaire, in which case most likely you will not make a mosque. So what you will still have is a small amount of money with you. So invest these small, 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 small changes here and there so that they can multiply. And invest them early because the earlier you invest, the more return you are going to be getting. So don't wait. Don't wait. When you go to a mosque and you see they're asking for sattva, put five rupees, put ten rupees, put one rupee, put whatever you have. Don't think it is too small. It's the intention that's are, that are important. If you're doing this for the sake of Allah, if you're doing this for the pleasure of Allah, and with sincerity, in that case, this will multiply. You know, it's not the Allah doesn't look at volume. Allah looks at our sincerity. That's more important. I think this is something that is there. But this ayat actually highlights the kind of uh, regret that people will face if they don't follow this uh, while they're still living in this world. And uh, if you have ever been to a person who is uh, close to his death, and I'm sure that you have relatives or people or who, uh, you know, are, are sick and they are dying or in their deathbed. And you, if you ask them, what did you, what you wish you would be, what you would have done differently? I had a friend, he, he had cancer and he knew about a year before that he was dying. And so therefore, you know, he had this long time to prepare for it. But 
honestly, when they are when they're in that last stage, and you ask them, none of them would have, would say, "I wish I had partied more. I wish I had actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, been to my office much more. I wish I had worked more more hard in this world." No, all of them would say, "I wish I had done more nakis." All of them. Some of them actually have very uh, sort of, you know, the belief in Allah is also not very strong, but they, they said, I wish I had done more righteous deeds while I was still living. I wish I had done more, re I wish I had given more of my wealth rather than leaving it behind for my heirs to fight on it. Uh, I wish I had given it in the way of Allah uh, 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 while I was still alive. So, so I think before this regret really comes in, uh, we need to just, uh, uh, we just need to make sure uh, that we are spending in the way of Allah. There are certain things which are compulsory for us to spend and honestly if we don't do that uh, we have a serious challenge because we have not done a farz which is uh, obviously the zakat because any su the surplus wealth that we have two and a half percent has to be given every year but other than that there should be a lot of sattah that we are doing. Uh, we just don't want the basic pass marks to reach uh, paradise. You see, giving zakat is just like 33% and you pass, but what good it is just to pass. We always want to be, you know, in first class and uh, have uh, A and A stars in this world. So therefore, just go beyond that also. Go beyond the minimum amounts that are required and spend more generously in people. Muslims are supposed to be always people who are very magnanimous, very generous. Uh, you know, this is, this is something that, uh, that you find in, in many of the people that I, I, I meet. One of the qualities that, that I see in uh, some of these very pious people is very generous with the, you know, when they're dealing with the other people. Generous in their praise, generous in feeding people, generous in feeding poor people, generous in spending in the way of Allah. I think this is a, this is a quality that is expected out of us uh, as being Muslims. Muslim is supposed to be magnanimous with a very big heart and ability to be able to spend on other people uh, while, uh, while, while you know, he can still live simply. And I think this is an important point and as you become richer, as you become richer, Allah makes you become much more rich. What you need to be doing is you need to maintain your own uh, standard of living uh, in a very simple way. Please live, in a, be, live a simple life. The simpler the life that you live, uh, the, the more easy it is for you to spend. The, the, the higher the standard that you raise, if you raise the standard of your living very, very high, obviously you will have very little left to be able to spend. But if you live a simple life, then you say, I mean, my life is simple. I spend, what, what do I need? I need just a, a little food in the day and some nice clothes to wear, which is not, doesn't cost you. So you have much more left over, which you can have, you'll have the ability to give people. Now you're spending too much on yourself and partying and going out on holidays, which are all allowed. I'm not saying that they're disallowed, but then you have very little spend to be, you know, left over to spend on, on, um, uh, uh, on other people. Now this last part uh, that this ayat says, well, kafirun ka humus zalimun and the unbelievers are the unjust. Ibn uh, Abi, uh, Abi uh, Hatim, uh, he recorded uh, from uh, Atta bin uh, Dinar and he said, all praise to Allah, uh, Alhamdulillah, that Allah has said it is the disbelievers who are the wrongdoers and not that the wrongdoers are the disbelievers. Now if Allah had said the, the wrongdoers are the disbelievers, every time, we would have done something wrong, we would have actually been equated to a murta, I mean we would have become a disbeliever. But Allah didn't say that. He said, well, kafiru zalimun, that is those people who do kufr. And this is a kufr is an opposite to belief also. And a kufr is opposite to shukar also. Kufr is opposite to shukar also. So if, if you're not doing shukar of Allah for the many things that you are actually doing, that's also a, a state of, of, uh, of, of being, a, being a kafir. So I think this is something that we need to understand. The next ayat is an uh, ayat that I'm sure all of you remember and uh, uh, all of you recite. Uh, Musnad Ahmad, uh, there is a hadith from Musnad Ahmad where our Prophet Sallallahu said that uh, this is the uh, most praiseworthy ayat of Quran. One of, I mean, I must say this is one of the most praiseworthy ayat of Quran, but it's a very comprehensive ayat which gives the uh, uh, descriptions of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The attributes of Allah being uh, given in this ayat and so therefore there are lots of uh, ihkam of reading this ayah after every first namaz uh, and this, is, this ayat is what you call ayat al-kursi and uh, because it's, the, it's mentioned over here, one of the words that people see over here. So let's just look at this ayat, which is ayat number 255 from Surah Al-Baqarah. 
and uh, this says allah la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum la ta'khuzuhu sinatun wa la nawm lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard man zal ladhi yashfa'u 'indahu illa bi iznihi ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhituna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bi ma sha'a wasi'a kursiyuhu as samawati wal ard wa la ya'buduhu hifzuhuma wa huwa al aliyul azim that allah there is no god but he so the beginning of that is allah allah la ilaha illahu there is no god but allah the ever living the al hayyul qayyum the ever living the eternal neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him and for him is all that is in the heavens and the earth and who is there who can intercede with him except except by his permission he knows what is before him and what is behind them and they cannot comprehend anything of his knowledge except what he pleases his throne extends over the heavens and the earth and he feels no fatigue in guarding them and he is the most high the most great so the attributes of allah being described over here that that he is ever living he is um, uh, you know uh, there is no sleep or slumber that overtakes him and all the attributes that are there like i said this is uh, ayatul kursi there are many many virtues that are there uh, in ayatul kursi the through many authentic ahadith uh, we uh, we learn that this is the greatest ayat uh, in the book of of allah which is in quran the greatest ayat that is there a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked which is the greatest ayat of quran and he said ayatul kursi and this is from ibn kasir uh, in uh, from the from ahmad uh, so uh, you, we can see many different ahadith in muslim bukhari uh, and ahmad and uh, ibn majah on, on this uh, Prophet asked uh, Ubay ibn Kaab which is the greatest ayat of Quran and he said uh, Ayatul Kursi and our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said uh, he took his name and he said may Allah bless you in your knowledge uh, this ayat has a tongue and two lips with which it praises the king next to the support of his throne and this is a hadith from uh, Musnad Ahmad now if uh, in another hadith which is a authentic hadith uh, our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if someone recites Ayatul Kursi after every farz namaz nothing stops him from entering into paradise except death so it's a good idea that after you complete your farz namaz you stay or a little bit people are in a hurry to move uh, and go away after farz namaz but you need to sit back a little bit you know do a little tasbih of allah and certainly it's a good idea for you to recite ayatul kursi as you see from this hadith that uh, this is uh, this is something that we really don't know when our death will come and maybe the next namaz will be our last uh, prayer so therefore it will be a, it's a, a great idea for you to recite i ayatul kursi so that there is nothing uh, stopping you from entering into paradise uh, except death so please recite this and this hadith is from an nasai uh, what it means is that after death the person will know that his destination is paradise uh, i mean just after death nobody goes into paradise because we all will be in, you know in barzakh for a certain period of time t till the day of judgment uh, is there uh, but you will have the uh, uh, you know uh, the comfort and the tranquility of knowing that your ultimate destination is going to be paradise that will be known to people and especially if you have recited ayatul kursi and uh, there is uh, another hadith uh, imam ahmad he recorded that abu ayub said uh, about uh, certain uh, you know certain uh, he used to he used to lose some dates he had some dates in the house and uh, he he was he complained to the prophet uh, about uh, this uh, dates being lost and our prophet said that you need to recite uh, ayatul kursi over there so reciting ayatul kursi prevents the harm from touching the reciter so in many places uh, uh, which you uh, which you go to which are new uh, which uh, you are not familiar with and sometimes you feel a little fear Uh, fear of the un because of the unknown, especially when you go in different places and you go in different hotels and things are not. You don't feel very comfortable. It's a good good idea to recite Aitul Kursi because when you recite Aitul Kursi, it prevents uh, from uh, harm any harm touching the the reciter. Uh, 